The letter arrived on a Tuesday, landing like a grenade in my perfectly ordered life. I almost missed it, buried between bills and junk mail, but my grandmother's lawyer's firm name caught my eye. My hands trembled as I tore open the envelope, standing in my kitchen where I'd shared countless cups of tea with Gran before she passed. My name is Laurel, and until that moment, I thought I'd process my grandmother's death as well as any doctor could. Being an oncologist, I'm familiar with loss, but nothing prepared me for what that letter contained. Dear Dr. Whitaker, it began formally. In accordance with your grandmother's final wishes, we are to deliver the enclosed key and instructions to you exactly six months after her passing. A small brass key fell into my palm as I unfolded the letter. My throat tightened. I recognized it immediately. It belonged to Gran's antique writing desk, the one piece of furniture she never let anyone touch. The contents of the locked drawer. The letter continued. Include your grandmother's personal diary and several documents she believed you should see. She was explicit that these materials be reviewed by you alone. My phone buzzed. Mother's name flashed across the screen. Marjorie Whitaker. 20 years of minimal contact, and suddenly she was calling daily since Gran's death. I let it go to voicemail, just like I had every other time. Laurel, honey. Her message played later as I poured a generous glass of wine. Clyde and I were thinking about visiting next weekend. There are some things we need to discuss about your grandmother's estate. I deleted the message before it finished. Classic Marjorie, absent for most of my life until money entered the equation. The same woman who left me with Gran when I was 12, running off with Clyde Harrington to start a new family, one without the burden of a preteen daughter. The key felt heavy in my pocket as I drove to Gran's house, my house now, though I hadn't changed a thing since the funeral. The porch light still burned, just as she'd always kept it. For strays, she used to say, both the four-legged and two-legged kind. Inside, everything remained exactly as she'd left it. The writing desk stood in its corner of the study, dark mahogany gleaming in the afternoon light. I approached it slowly, running my fingers along its smooth surface, remembering how Gran would shoo me away whenever she caught me trying to peek inside. The key slid in perfectly. The drawer opened with a soft click. Inside lay a leather-bound journal, its pages yellow with age, and beneath it, a stack of letters bound with faded ribbon. My hands shook as I lifted out the journal, Gran's familiar handwriting flowing across its pages. The first entry was dated 20 years ago, the day after my mother left. My dearest Laurel, it began, if you're reading this, I'm no longer here to protect you from the truth. There are things you need to know about your mother's departure, things I've kept hidden to spare you pain. But you're stronger now, and it's time you understood the real reason Marjorie left that day. My phone buzzed again. This time, it was my half-sister Ruby's name on the screen. Sweet, innocent Ruby, who'd tried so hard over the years to bridge the gap between our broken family halves. I hesitated, then declined the call. Whatever secrets this journal held, whatever truths Gran had kept hidden, they could change everything. The carefully constructed walls I'd built around my heart, the professional distance I'd maintained for my mother's new family, all of it might crumble once I turned these pages. I poured another glass of wine and settled into Gran's favorite reading chair. Outside, storm clouds gathered, casting the study in shadows. Perfect weather for unearthing family secrets. Taking a deep breath, I began to read. Gran's diary entry from that night hit me like a punch to the gut. I had to set it down, my hands trembling as I paced the study. The storm outside had picked up, rain pelting against the windows like accusations. Your mother came to me that morning, Gran had written, desperate and afraid. She said Clyde had given her an ultimatum, leave with him that day, or he'd ensure she never saw a penny of his family's money again. But there was more to it than that. Something darker that made her hands shake as she spoke. The entry ended there, the next page torn out. Classic Gran, leaving breadcrumbs instead of answers. I was about to close the diary when something slipped from between its pages, a photograph I'd never seen before. My mother, much younger, holding me as a baby. But it was her expression that caught me off guard. 
She was looking at me, with such raw love it made my chest ache. The doorbell rang, startling me so badly, I dropped the photo. Through the rain-streaked window, I caught a glimpse of Ruby's red umbrella. I know you're in there, she called out, her voice muffled by the storm. Your car's outside, Laurel. Please, we need to talk. I considered pretending I wasn't home, but Ruby had inherited Gran's persistence. She'd camp out all night if she had to. You look terrible, she said when I opened the door. She brushed past me, shaking water from her coat. Have you been crying? I don't cry, I said automatically, but my reflection in the hallway mirror betrayed me. What are you doing here, Ruby? Dad's planning something. She twisted her hands together, a nervous habit she'd had since childhood. He's been making calls, meeting with lawyers. I overheard him tell mom that he's found a way to contest Gran's will. The diary suddenly felt like it was burning a hole through the desk drawer. He can't. The will is ironclad. There's something else. Ruby lowered her voice, glancing around as if Clyde might materialize from the shadows. He's got papers, old ones, from before mom married him. I couldn't see what they were, but... A crash from upstairs cut her off. We both froze, staring at the ceiling. I thought you said you were here alone, Ruby whispered. I was already moving toward the stairs, grabbing Gran's old tennis racket from the umbrella stand, the closest thing to a weapon within reach. Ruby followed close behind, her phone's flashlight beam bouncing off the walls. The noise had come from Gran's bedroom. The door stood slightly ajar, though I distinctly remembered closing it earlier. Inside, the window was open, curtains billowing in the wind, rain soaking into the carpet. And there, silhouetted against the lightning, was a figure hunched over Gran's dresser, rifling through the drawers. Stop right there, I commanded, wielding the tennis racket like a sword. The figure straightened slowly, turning to face us. In the next flash of lightning, I recognized the sharp features and perfectly styled hair, even after all these years. Hello, Laurel, said Aunt Opal, clutching a stack of papers to her chest. I was hoping to avoid this particular family reunion. What are you doing here? My voice shook with anger. How did you get in? Your grandmother gave me a key years ago. Opal's smile was razor thin. She knew someone would need to clean up after she was gone. Some things are better left buried, dear. For everyone's sake. Behind me, Ruby gasped. Those are the same kind of papers Dad has. Opal's expression flickered. So Clyde found his copy. I should have known he wouldn't let this go. She straightened her spine. Every inch the proper lady she'd always pretended to be. We need to talk, Laurel about what really happened the day your mother left. Lightning flashed again, illuminating the papers in Opal's hands. In that brief moment, I caught a glimpse of what looked like a contract, my mother's signature bold at the bottom. The truth, it seemed, was about to get a lot more complicated. The contract in Aunt Opal's hands was dated exactly one week before my mother left. I stared at it through burning eyes as we sat in Gran's kitchen, the storm still raging outside. Ruby had made coffee none of us were drinking. It's a custody agreement, Opal said, sliding the papers across the table. Your mother signed away her parental rights. Not because of Clyde's ultimatum, but because of something else entirely. My hands wouldn't stop shaking as I read. Legal jargon filled the pages, but one paragraph stood out. In exchange for maintaining silence regarding the events of March 15, 1999, Marjorie Whitaker agrees to. What happened on March 15th? I demanded. Opal's face tightened. That's not my story to tell. But your mother didn't abandon you for money, Laurel. She left to protect you. Ruby leaned forward, her coffee forgotten. Protect her from what? Before Opal could answer, my phone buzzed. Marjorie's name flashed on the screen again, but this time, there was a text. Clyde knows about the contract. He's coming for the house. Don't let him in. As if on cue, headlights swept across the kitchen windows. A car door slammed. He followed me, Ruby whispered, face pale. I'm so sorry, I should have been more careful. Opal moved faster than I'd ever seen her move, gathering the papers. Get these somewhere safe. Now. Heavy footsteps on the porch. Then pounding on the door. Laurel. Clyde's voice boomed through the house. 
Open up. We need to discuss your grandmother's estate. I shoved the contract into Gran's recipe box and thrust it at Ruby. Back door. Go to my apartment. Don't stop for anything. Ruby hesitated only a moment before slipping out through the kitchen. The pounding continued. I know you're in there. Your aunt's car is outside. A pause. Don't make me call the police, Laurel. I have documentation proving your grandmother wasn't of sound mind when she changed her will. Opal's laugh was bitter. Documentation he fabricated, no doubt. She straightened her spine. Let him in. It's time we ended this charade. Are you insane? I hissed, but I was already moving toward the door. Twenty years of questions were about to be answered, one way or another. Clyde burst in the moment I turned the lock, rain dripping from his expensive coat. He'd aged since I'd last seen him, but his eyes were still cold and calculating. Where is it? He demanded, scanning the room. Hello to you too, stepfather. I said, ice in my voice. Please come in. Make yourself at home. Don't play games with me, girl. That contract could ruin everything I've built. The contract you used to blackmail my mother? The words felt like poison in my mouth. Or is there another one I should know about? Clyde's face darkened. Your mother made her choice. She knew what would happen if she ever told you the truth about that night. What truth? My voice cracked. What was so terrible that she had to leave her own daughter? The truth, a new voice said from the doorway, about what your father really did to me. We all turned. There stood my mother, soaked from the rain, looking smaller than I remembered. But her eyes were steel as she faced Clyde. You promised, he growled. You signed. I promised to stay quiet to protect my daughter, Marjorie said. But she's not a child anymore. And I'm done letting you use my past against me. She turned to me, tears mixing with raindrops on her face. Your father didn't die in an accident, Laurel. He was murdered. And Clyde. She took a shuddering breath. Clyde helped cover it up. The kitchen clock ticked loudly in the silence that followed. Outside, lightning flashed, illuminating all our faces in stark white. The guilty, the innocent, and those of us somewhere in between. I looked at my mother, really looked at her, and saw for the first time the weight she'd been carrying all these years. The choice she'd made wasn't about money at all. It had been about survival. Police lights flashed silently outside Grand's house as Detective Morris took our statements. It was nearly midnight, and the truth about my father's death hung in the air like smoke. Clyde had disappeared into the back of a patrol car an hour ago, leaving chaos in his wake. Let me get this straight, Morris said, reviewing his notes. Your father's car accident in 99 wasn't an accident at all? My mother sat across from me, hands wrapped around a cold cup of tea. She hadn't stopped shaking. Frank was going to expose Clyde's embezzlement scheme. The brake lines in his car weren't cut by accident. I stood up abruptly, needing to move. Twenty years of believing my father had died because of black ice on a dark road. And now this. Why didn't you tell someone? Why didn't you go to the police back then? Because of these. Aunt Opal spread out more papers on the table, photographs this time. They showed my father's car, but there was something else. Something that made my stomach turn. Clyde made it look like your father had been drinking. He planted evidence. Made sure your mother knew that if she talked, everyone would believe Frank died driving drunk with his 12-year-old daughter in the car. The room spun slightly. I'd been in the car that night. I remembered dad dropping me at a friend's house just hours before the crash. He threatened to destroy Frank's reputation, my mother whispered, to make you grow up believing your father was responsible for his own death. I couldn't. I couldn't let that happen. Detective Morris's pen scratched across his notepad. And M.S. Whitaker, Evelyn, she knew about this. Gran knew everything. I said, the pieces finally clicking into place. That's why she left me the diary. She was making sure the truth would come out after she was gone. A soft knock at the door made us all jump. Ruby stood there, still clutching Gran's recipe box with the contract inside. Dad's lawyer is here, she said quietly. He's saying, he's saying there's no proof. That it's all hearsay after 20 years. The detective's face remained carefully neutral. Physical evidence from that long ago will be difficult to recover. Without a confession, 
There's more. My mother's voice had changed, stronger now. She reached into her purse and pulled out a USB drive. I've been collecting evidence for years. Bank records, emails, conversations I recorded. I knew someday Clyde would slip up, get too confident. When he started pushing about Evelyn's estate, I knew it was time. Morris took the drive like it might explode. You've been building a case against your own husband? I've been waiting for a chance to protect my daughter. Both my daughters. She looked at Ruby, then at me. I should have done it sooner. I'm so sorry, Laurel. I thought I was protecting you, but I was just protecting myself from having to face what I'd done. Ruby moved to sit beside our mother, taking her hand. The gesture was so simple, so forgiving, it made my throat tight. There's something else you should see, Opal said, pulling one final envelope from her bag. Evelyn wrote this the day before she died. She made me promise to keep it until we had proof about Frank's death. The letter inside was in Gran's familiar handwriting, but shakier than I remembered. As I read, my hands began to tremble. My dearest Laurel, it began, by now you know the truth about your father. What you don't know is that he left something for you. Something Clyde has been searching for all these years. I looked up at my mother, whose eyes had gone wide with recognition. The evidence, she breathed, the original evidence of Clyde's embezzlement. Frank hid it somewhere in this house before he died. That's the real reason Clyde wanted the estate. He's still looking for it. Detective Morris was already reaching for his radio. We need to get a forensics team in here. Now. Outside, more police cars were arriving, but I barely noticed. I was already moving toward Grand Study, my mind racing. If Dad had hidden something in this house 20 years ago, there was only one place he would have put it. The same place I used to hide my own secrets as a child, behind the loose brick in the study fireplace. The loose brick slid out easily, as if it had been waiting all these years for my touch. Inside was a dusty manila envelope, sealed with my father's familiar scrawl across the front. For my laurel, when the time is right. Did you find something? Detective Morris called from the doorway. Before I could answer, Ruby's scream pierced the air. He's out. Dad's out on bail. My mother appeared behind Morris, face ashen. That's impossible. The evidence. His family's lawyers moved fast, Morris said grimly. We need to get that envelope into evidence now. I clutched the package to my chest, my father's last message to me. I need five minutes with this first. Laurel. My mother stepped forward. We don't have time. Five minutes. I repeated, my voice sharp enough to make her flinch. You've had 20 years to process this. I need five minutes. I locked myself in Gran's bathroom, hands shaking as I opened the envelope. Inside were bank statements, photographs, and a letter. But what caught my eye was a small key card with a bank logo and safety deposit box number. My phone buzzed. Unknown number. Hello, Laurel. Clyde's voice was eerily calm. I believe you have something that belongs to me. Nothing here belongs to you. No? Ask your mother about December 12, 1998. Ask her what really happened to those missing funds before your father started investigating me. The bathroom door rattled. Laurel? It was Ruby. Dad's car just pulled up outside. I stared at the documents in my hands. December 12, 1998. There it was, a transfer record with my mother's signature. She was in on it. I whispered. At the beginning. Smart girl, Clyde said. Your mother helped me set up those accounts. She only turned on me when your father found out. She's not the victim she pretends to be. The front door slammed downstairs. Heavy footsteps. I'm coming up, Clyde called out. Let's handle this like family. I cracked open the bathroom door. Ruby stood there, tears streaming down her face. Mom's gone. She just ran out the back door. Of course, she had. Running was what she did best. Get these to Morris. I shoved the envelope at Ruby. Go out the window, down the trellis like we used to. Don't stop for anything. What about you? I pulled Gran's diary from my pocket. I need answers first. Laurel? Clyde's voice was closer now. Let's talk about a deal. Ruby squeezed my hand before disappearing through the window. I walked out to face my stepfather, 
Gran's diary held tight against my chest. He stood at the top of the stairs, still in his expensive suit despite the late hour. Where are the documents? Gone. Like your leverage over my mother. His smile didn't reach his eyes. You really think she's worth protecting? After everything she's done? I'm not protecting her. The diary's spine crackled under my grip. I'm finishing what my father started. Your father was a fool who didn't understand business. My father, I said quietly, taught me where to hide things. Want to know what else he taught me? Clyde took a step forward. Don't play games. He taught me that the truth always comes out. December 12th, 1998. I know mom helped you. But I also know from Gran's diary that she tried to stop you once she realized what you were really doing. That's why you needed her gone. Why you threatened her with my father's reputation. His face darkened. You have no proof. I have Gran's diary. I have Ruby's testimony about your threats. And I have. I pulled out my phone, showing him the recording icon. Your confession from downstairs earlier. The police may have let you go, but they're going to love hearing this. Clyde lunged forward just as Detective Morris appeared behind him, gun drawn. That's enough, Morris said. Hands where I can see them. As they led Clyde away again, I saw my mother standing in the garden, watching through tears. She took a step toward the house, but I turned away. Some betrayals cut too deep for second chances. Or so I thought. Three days after Clyde's arrest, I found myself sitting in the safety deposit box vault, staring at the contents of box 2317. My father's final evidence lay scattered before me. Photos, ledgers, and a videotape labeled insurance. But it was the handwritten confession that made my hands shake. My mother's confession, dated the day before my father died. The bank manager cleared his throat. Dr. Whitaker, your sister's here. Ruby looked exhausted as she slid into the chair beside me. Mom's asking for you. She's, she's not doing well. She's doing exactly what she's always done, I said, spreading out the confession. Running, hiding, lying. She tried to make it right. Ruby's voice cracked. That confession proves it. She was going to turn herself in, turn dad in too. And dad died before she could. The words tasted bitter. How convenient. The police found something else. Ruby pulled out her phone, showing me a video. Security footage from the bank, dated December 12, 1998. My mother, younger and terrified, standing at a teller window while Clyde loomed behind her. His hand gripping her arm, hidden from the teller's view. She was his victim too, Ruby whispered. I shoved back from the table. Don't. Don't make excuses for her. She had choices. Like what? Let him kill dad sooner? Let him come after you. Ruby's voice rose. You read Gran's diary. You know what Clyde was capable of. The diary. I'd been avoiding its final pages, afraid of what else I might learn. Afraid Gran's last words might force me to forgive when all I wanted was justice. My phone buzzed. Detective Morris. Clyde made bail again. Higher-ups intervening. Watch your back. Ruby read the message over my shoulder. He'll come for the evidence. For all of us. Let him try. I gathered the documents, but Ruby grabbed my wrist. You sound just like Dad did. Her words hit like a slap. All righteous anger and no self-preservation. Look where that got him. What do you expect me to do? Forgive and forget. I expect you to survive. Ruby's eyes filled with tears. Mom's in the hospital because she finally stood up to him. She took pills, Laurel. They're saying, they're saying she might not make it. The world tilted sideways. What? She left a note. For you. Ruby pulled out an envelope, hospital letterhead visible through the thin paper. She said if anything happened to her, you'd find the rest of Dad's evidence in her old music box. The one she left behind when, when she abandoned me. I stared at the envelope remembering that music box. The one that played Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. The one I'd smashed against the wall the day after she left. Oh God. The realization hit like ice water. The pieces. I threw them away. What pieces? The music box. I destroyed it. My legs gave out and I sank into the chair. 
If there was evidence inside. Ruby's phone rang. Her face went pale as she listened. We have to go. Now. Dad's been to the house. He's torn it apart looking for something, and now he's heading to the hospital. To mom. I looked down at the confession in my hands. Twenty years of anger and betrayal ward with the image of my mother, young and frightened, Clyde's hand leaving bruises on her arm. If we lose her, Ruby's voice broke. If he gets to her before she wakes up, we'll never know the whole truth. The truth. I'd been so focused on exposing it, on finally understanding why my family had shattered, that I hadn't considered the cost. Now my mother was dying, Clyde was free, and the final pieces of evidence might be sitting in a landfill somewhere, destroyed by my own teenage rage. Sometimes revenge doesn't taste like justice at all. Sometimes it tastes like ashes and regret. Let's go, I said, pocketing the confession. It's time to end this, one way or another. The hospital corridor stretched before me like a gauntlet. Ruby had gone to get security, leaving me alone outside my mother's room. Through the window, I could see her still form, tubes and wires making her look smaller than I remembered. Movement at the end of the hall caught my eye. Clyde. I slipped into the room, quietly closing the door. My mother's heart monitor beeped steadily as I pulled Gran's diary from my bag, finally opening to those last pages I'd been avoiding. I knew you'd come. I spun around. My mother's eyes were open, clear despite the medication. Save your strength, I said, moving toward the call button. She caught my wrist. The music box. Did you find it? I destroyed it. Twenty years ago. A faint smile touched her lips. No. You didn't. Her voice was barely a whisper. Your grandmother? She saved the pieces. Built a false bottom. In her jewelry box. The door opened. Clyde stood there, his expensive suit incongruous against the sterile hospital walls. Family reunion? His smile didn't reach his eyes. How touching. It's over, Clyde. I positioned myself between him and the bed. We have everything. The confession, the bank footage, Dad's evidence. You have pieces of a puzzle you don't understand. He closed the door behind him. Your father was going to destroy everything I'd built. Your mother helped me stop him. She was trying to protect me, I said, but doubt crept in. You threatened her. Did I? He pulled out his phone, showing me an old email from my mother to him, dated the day before dad died. Read it. My hands shook as I took the phone. Meet me at the usual place. Frank suspects nothing. Everything's arranged. No. My mother's voice was stronger now. Show her the rest. Clyde's face darkened. Marjorie? The rest of the email thread, she insisted. The part where you threatened to hurt Laurel if I didn't help you. The part where you admitted to tampering with Frank's car. A commotion erupted in the hallway. Ruby's voice raised an argument with hospital security. It doesn't matter now. Clyde moved closer to the bed. None of you will testify. Not if you want to keep your medical license, Laurel. Did you think I wouldn't find out about those prescriptions you wrote for your grandmother? The ones that helped ease her passing? My breath caught. Grand's last days. The pain medication. Leave her alone. My mother struggled to sit up. I've already sent copies of everything to the police. Everything, Clyde. Including what you did to your first wife. The monitor's beeping accelerated as Clyde reached for my mother. I moved without thinking, years of suppressed rage finally finding their target. The diary flew from my hands as I shoved him back, papers scattering across the floor. Among them, fluttering like leaves, were photographs. Not from the music box or dad's evidence, but from Gran's diary. Photos of a young woman, bruised and frightened. Clyde's first wife. Gran knew, I whispered. She knew all along. She tried to warn Frank. My mother's voice cracked. That's why, that's why I had to choose. You or him. I chose you. Clyde lunged for the photos, but the door burst open. Ruby stood there with Detective Morris and two officers. Actually, Ruby said, holding up her phone, you chose all of us. She'd been recording everything. As they led Clyde away, I picked up Gran's diary. The final entry was short. 
Sometimes the greatest act of love is letting go of revenge. Forgiveness isn't weakness, my dear Laurel. It's the strength to build something new from the ashes of what was lost. My mother's hand found mine, warm despite everything. I never stopped loving you, she whispered, even when I had to let you hate me. Outside, the sun was rising, painting the hospital room in shades of gold and shadow. Sometimes the light shows us things we couldn't see in the dark, like the difference between justice and revenge, or the fine line between love and sacrifice. I squeezed my mother's hand, 20 years of anger finally giving way to something else, something that felt almost like hope. Six months after Clyde's conviction, I stood in grand study, my study now, sorting through the last of her belongings. Ruby sat cross-legged on the floor, piecing together the restored music box while our mother watched from the doorway, still moving carefully after her hospital stay. Found it, Ruby announced, fitting the final piece into place. The false bottom slid open with a click, revealing not documents, but a single photograph. My father holding me as a baby, my mother beside him, all of us laughing at something just out of frame. I remember that day, my mother said softly. Frank had just told one of his terrible jokes. I traced the edge of the photo, wondering how different things might have been if we'd stayed frozen in that moment of joy. Why did Gran keep this hidden instead of the evidence? Because evidence proves guilt, Ruby said, wisdom beyond her years in her voice. But this proves there was something worth saving. The doorbell rang. Aunt Opal stood on the porch, clutching a familiar leather-bound book. Found this while packing up my place, she said, holding out another of Gran's diaries. It's from before. Everything. When your parents first met. I took the diary, but didn't open it. Some stories didn't need to be excavated. Some truths could rest in peace. I'm selling the house, I announced suddenly. Three pairs of eyes turned to me in surprise. But it's your home, my mother protested. Everything you fought to protect was never about the house. I moved to the window, watching shadows stretch across Grand's garden. It was about understanding why. Why you left, why dad died, why Grand kept so many secrets. But understanding doesn't mean we have to live in the shadow of those choices forever. Ruby stood, brushing dust from her jeans. Where will you go? There's a practice opening up near the coast. They need an oncologist. I turned back to my family, this patchwork of broken pieces we were slowly fitting back together. It's only an hour away, close enough for Sunday dinners, far enough to start fresh. My mother's hands trembled as she picked up the music box. When she wounded, moonlight sonata filled the room, each note carrying echoes of the past. Your grandmother wrote something else, Opal said quietly, in that last diary, about revenge and forgiveness being two sides of the same coin, both ways of holding on to pain. And what's the alternative? I asked. Ruby answered, letting go. Later that night, after everyone had left, I sat in Grand's chair one last time. The study felt different now, lighter somehow. On my laptop, an email from Detective Morris waited. They'd found more of Clyde's victims, other families he'd tried to destroy. My testimony wouldn't be needed at the new trials. I closed the laptop without responding. Let someone else carry the torch of justice. My war was over. The music box sat on the desk, moonlight gleaming off its restored surface. Inside, beneath the false bottom, I'd placed a new photograph, one taken last week at Ruby's graduation. My mother and I flanking her, all of us smiling despite the years of pain between us. Or maybe because of them. Grand's final diary entry had been right. The strongest families aren't the ones that never break, but the ones that learn to rebuild from the pieces. I packed the music box carefully in my bag. Tomorrow, I'd start looking for coastal properties. Something with big windows and a garden, where shadows couldn't linger. Maybe with room for guests. As I locked up the house one last time, I thought I caught a whiff of Gran's perfume, heard the echo of her laugh. But when I turned, there was only moonlight and the soft whisper of leaves in the garden she'd loved so much. Some ghosts I was learning don't need to be exorcised. Some can stay, teaching us how to love better, forgive deeper, live fuller. 
And sometimes, the best revenge isn't revenge at all. It's building something beautiful from the ashes of what was lost. I drove away from my grandmother's house for the last time, the music box safe beside me, carrying its cargo of broken melodies and new beginnings.